<clears throat> I, um, you know, I've talked a lot about uh, what the effects are of the looking and how it, uh, how it pans out over time. Uh, from my own experience, but also from the experience that's been reported to us with some uh, some detail and uh, and clarity by uh, actually a large number of other people, and in 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 truth, it's probably more effective for you to hear from them than it is for me. I mean. You know, like I have an agenda. My agenda is to uh, bring this to you and uh, and cure you of the fear of life. And uh, actually, my agenda is to bring it to all of humanity. But these folks here, are folks just like you, who who uh, whose lives were just like your lives, and whose approach to the this. Uh, work is was sometimes off and on and problematic and and uh, tentative and so forth until it finally took them. So I'm going to read you one of these. I I just think it's important that when we're talking about the fact the effects that we hear from somebody other than me. Now this particular report actually we just recently. Most, the, the greatest majority of the time that we spend with people these days is online. I actually would not want to live without meetings like this where I get to be face to face and <coughs> in close proximity of people. I think I would probably uh, not be able to continue to be very effective in this work if I limited myself. To the to the to the platform that is uh, the internet, but the internet is an extremely powerful and magnificent uh, tool. It is because of the internet that it's actually possible for us to reach as many people as we want to reach, and we have a community of thousands all over the world. It's some of the weirdest places. I mean, it's probably not weird for them, but, you know, <laughs> weird for me. Uh, Madagascar and Serbia and, uh, and, uh, Uzbekistan and Russia and, uh, Israel and South Africa, Kenya, Brazil. Brazil. <laughs> <coughs> Go Brazil. <laughs> And, and recently, as we, you know, we have, we have uh, embarked upon a, a great adventure, a great project to bring this to everybody in the world. And in the course of launching this project and, uh, and beginning to see the, the, the fact that it actually just might work, we called upon people to send us in reports, and we encouraged them to, no matter what they thought, that we were not interested in cherry-picked reports of success and, and smooth sailing and so forth. We were interested in the actual reports from human beings as to their experience with life uh, in, the, in the context of the looking. <clears throat> And we received a number of them. And one of the things that I'll probably harp on more than once in the time remaining to us is uh, I really, really <clears throat> encourage you to go to the website and go to the community center. There is a, a growing, vibrant, and alive and enthusiastic community of people who are in this work, in this approach, and who are talking to each other and talking to us and 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 carrying out this very conversation that that I see to be 
fundamentally important to to human beings, really, this conversation. And I really encourage you to do that. I really encourage you, if you're not uh, familiar or savvy with the Internet, to learn how to use it. And go to our website, go to the community center, and see what's happening there. Because that's where you'll hear most of it from people, about what the actual effect is in their own life. Now this particular thing that I'm going to read, the person who sent this to us subsequently sent in a uh, one of the reports that we asked for, and it's, you know, present in that context as well. <clears throat> but this was sent to us before that. And in fact, I suspect that it might have been the trigger for us specifically asking uh, her to, to uh, join us in this uh, report. I found it just well, before I got here, I went to the forums. I said, Carla, can you think of, a, of some, uh, some decent report that I can find without having to look too far to show these folks about what other people are saying? And she made a couple suggestions, and I looked at them and didn't like them. And so I'd just kind of gone through them, and I came upon this. And this is, uh, so this is not a report that was solicited as a report of their, her experience with the look. This was her spontaneous uh, report to us after a period of, of uh, uh, not, not, not communicating with us. <clears throat> I just want you to, uh, and there's nothing spectacular in here. There's no spectacular breakthroughs that we're going to hear about here. But what we're going to hear is an actual human being reporting their actual experience with, with this approach in their own life. Just wanted to drop you guys a quick note to let you know I'm still looking and doing well. One theme that seemed to come up repeatedly in recent podcasts is we also, you know, have a lot of podcasts. Everything we do is out there. One thing that came up repeatedly in recent podcasts is wanting some kind of signal, people wanting some kind of signal that the looking has done its job. Some confirmation of having reached the end point of the process, or at least confirmation that the looking is working. I was very interested in those conversations because that sense of completion slash having, quote, made it, used to be what I craved most strongly in doing this work. I understood quite well intellectually what John's frequent response that there is no point of completion because life has no point of completion. But understanding that idea didn't make the craving go away. While through no particular action or process that I know of, I don't have that craving anymore. That's not to say it won't come back, but for quite a while now, I just haven't really been thinking about or interested in whether or not I'm done. That question feels, to borrow John's phrase, beside the point. I can't think of any better way to put it, beside the point. I'm here, always the same and unharmed, and living my life which is always changing. I spend less time now thinking about my relationship with life than I used to, but when I do, it does seem like things have changed quite a lot. I never really got what John was talking about when he'd say to look at my relationship with life in order to check for effects of the looking, and that the closing of the gap between me and my life would be a sign that the looking is working. Even though I had a feeling this wasn't what John meant by that, I just couldn't imagine what this closing of the gap would feel like, other than that I would like my life more and have more pleasant feelings, all unpleasant feelings would go away, etc. In other words, everything we think we're going to get from every other thing we've ever tried to make life right. Well, that's not exactly where I'd say I am now. But I do relate very strongly to something John once described as the relationship with life disappearing. I feel like that's exactly what's happened with me. 
my relationship with life, all the commentary and happening, all the my relationship with life, all the commentary and judgment about what's going on in my life, what's not right, what needs to be fixed, frustration over how hard it's going to be to fix these things, despair over the sense that I won't be able to do it, those things are disappearing. And in the fading away of that relationship, I am starting to feel more at home in my own life. These are things I don't notice unless I make a concerted effort. Most of the time these days I just do what I need to do, enjoy things I like, deal with problems as they arise and grumble a bit, but not, but don't get nearly as miserable as I used to. It's sort of like a persistent bad taste I used to have in my mouth all the time is fading away. And that's wonderful. But I don't even notice the fading away so much because I'm more interested in paying attention to the new tastes I'm experiencing now, that they're not masked by the bad taste. That's not to say all anxiety and pain have departed, but lately I'm kind of okay with those things being around. They come when they come, and a while later they go away. Living is good. Love and gratitude to John and Carla and all the folks in the community. I couldn't say it any better than that. That's what it feels like when the results of this looking begin to manifest in your own life. That's what I mean when I say that I promised that I was going to tell you how to tell whether you were making progress or not. That's how you tell. You look at the relationship you have with your life. That's where progress shows up. It's not in the, as, as, as she points out, it's not in the balance between unpleasant and pleasant things. It's not in that at all. It's the relationship between you and your life, which has been, and, and, and the fact that, in a sense, and I've said this and probably will again, the, in the end, the relationship with your life disappears. You can only have a relationship with something that is distant from you, that is apart from you. So the way to monitor your progress is not by looking at all the things and whether there's a preponderance of good things as opposed to bad things, but look at the relationship with your life. Look and see to what extent it is still the case that you hold life at arm's length, that you examine and interrogate every phenomena that arises within it to determine its nature and its effect, its likely impact on you. That's where you look. And the, in the end, what the, what the, what the, there is no end. Life doesn't end. Life is always changing. Life is the expression of existence, the natural, spontaneous, expression of existence, and it's constantly changing, morphing, moving, now this, now that, this comes, that goes, something else appears. But in the end, when the disease is full and finally cured, when its effects and the process of recovery is full and finally finished, in the end, what you're left with is the indistinguishability, the impossibility of finding a line where you begin and life ends, or where life begins and you end. That's the finish of it. And then things are as they are. Problems arise, pleasure arises, confusion arises, none of which has ever, will ever, and does now affect you in any way whatsoever, except to attract your interest as the taste of it, the, the sense of it, the density of it, the texture of it.
I don't know what else to say. These things, like, like the uh, the neurotic uh, reactive behaviors that I spoke about, connected with my smoking and so forth this morning, these things just vanish. Neurotic behaviors, neurotic relationships, neurotic uh, grasping, resistance, all of those things, they just go away. And it is not uncommon for it to be some time before we notice that anything's changed at all. They just go away. Nothing Nothing spectacular and new comes to wipe away the bad and encourage the good. Things are as they have always been, unpredictable, complicated, problematic sometimes, satisfying, always satisfying, but pleasurable other times, uh, always satisfying. The, the, The characteristics of my personality as always, are constantly changing. They have always been constantly changing. And it was only by sheer force of will that I was able to try to to freeze my personality, the things I think, into a concrete form that I could depend upon. And that I could, so that I could be, like I knew that this was the case, and I know this is the case, I know this is the case, and I don't, anything that comes in that is in any way conflicting with those things, then I know that I have to reject it. And I know that I need this and I don't need that. And I know that I want this and I don't want that. And those are all aspects of the neurotic reactive behaviors that characterize my entire personality for all of my life. And then they just started to disappear. No redeemer came to wipe them out. No magic cure came to wipe them out and extinguish them and wash clean my mind. They just began to fade away, to vanish. That's what happens. Things leave. It's not the arrival of something new that this work brings. It's the, it's the falling away of the old and useless and antagonistic and competitive, and and contentious, self-destructive, reactive, neurotic behaviors. And since it's a vanishing of something, it's not the appearance of anything, oftentimes we don't notice it until we do. Sooner or later we do. But oftentimes we don't notice that these things have departed. How How would you notice it's gone? You know, I know that like another thing from my own experience, much, much earlier on, is I have always, or I had always throughout my life, <laughs> and it's kind of a, kind of a funny thing. We have a, a relationship now with a group of people who are, uh, with whom we are uh, seeking to develop a, a comprehensive project plan and an organizational structure that can support the kind of uh, communication we want to be capable of during this upcoming year. And one of these people is a man who actually, uh, he was here at the last year's retreat, and he is a, a psychotherapist of long standing, and uh, and until recently was uh, the warden of the New Jersey State Penitentiary, which is really kind of uh, of sweet, you know. (laughs) Uh, New Jersey is my home state also, by the way. And the penitentiary, of course, is uh, my, (laughs) my second home. 
I lived in the penitentiary longer than I lived in New Jersey. <laughs> but David and uh, has uh, spoken to me from time to time. We, we, you know, all this time I'm going to talk about this. I, I, you know, I don't know how I get to these things, but I, I get myself in a trick bag where I end up going down a road that I never intended to go down. But there you go. We have been, Carla and I, you know, we've been, we've been doing this, just Carla and I, that's all, just Carla and I, mostly Carla, when it comes to the actual work that brings all of this stuff into existence, it's pretty much at least 90% Carla. But Carla, I'm, you know, I've been a part of it too. But <laughs> Carla, Carla and I, for 12 years, have uh, been doing this all by ourselves. This has been our life, and and we had a, a definite, we had an understanding of what we were doing, and we had an understanding of where we thought we might want to go, although we didn't know that we would ever get there. And where we thought we might want to go was to where we are now, where I actually can say, look at yourself with confidence and assurance that I am, I am as close as I can get to what actually needs to be done. And with confidence and assurance that if anybody hears it, everybody who hears it most likely will try it, whether they believe in it or don't believe in it. If I tell you, look, just get a look at what it feels like to be you. You know, you don't have to believe anything. You don't have to take on board anything, you don't have to pay any money, you don't have to agree to anything or disagree with anything. Just look at you. Just at you. It's my sense that anybody, if I can get that in the ears of people cleanly and directly enough, free of, uh, free of the baggage that triggers uh, reactive, defensive uh, relationship with it, that anybody who hears it will just kind of automatically try it. And since I am also completely convinced that anyone who tries it cannot fail, although, you know, I suppose it's possible to delay and sabotage and so forth the development of the, of its effect, anybody who tries it cannot fail. I, I am convinced that, that this is a time, David calls it a perfect storm, but I think that's a little, negative image, but a, a time when all the circumstances have come together in a, in a confluence that, that for the first time ever allows for the possibility of actually bringing a message like this pretty much to the entire species. Not directly, maybe, but to a large enough portion of the species that everybody, every, all humanity will hear of it which is all I want is for them to hear of it. So that's the, the motive behind the Just Look at Just One Look project. Okay, so anyway, in the course of meeting with people and starting to look for, you know, volunteers like financial managers and, and um, uh, internet, you know, wizards and all the things that w are needed in order to make a project that the, like this work, David has pointed out to us that that I just am, seem to be unwilling to ask for money, that I have some weird relationship with money that uh, is antagonistic and uh, uh, doesn't do us any good. And that's not really so much the case. The case is that when Carla and I were working on this, we felt that uh, I felt and Carla felt that uh, that there was no point if all we were doing was saying the same words that a bucket full of other non-dual and Advaita Vedanta teachers were saying, then there was no point in us entering into competition for limited resources when we weren't saying anything different. We wanted to say something different, but we weren't. So we were very reluctant actually to actively seek any money. And we, although we used to charge for events, we stopped doing that when it first began to 
dawn on us that we actually were on the right track and that we actually might come up with something useful to people because I don't want people to have to make a financial decision in order to hear something that could actually free them from that which causes the whole sense of human life as a problem to be solved. But we've been very, very, very low-keyed in our relationship with money, in our relationship with the community of people that have supported us. And all, pretty much our entire uh, financial basis for 12 years has been spontaneous donations from folks like you and a lot of other people who saw some value in our work. Every once in a while we would uh, uh, get to a point where there was an actual kind of financial emergency and we'd send out an email to everybody asking for help in this emergency and that was always taken care of like very quickly without any problems whatsoever. But we did that very seldom. I was very reluctant and resistant to talking to people and trying to get more money. I didn't want to do that. And part of it was because of the what I saw about the usefulness of what we were doing. But part of it also was the fact that I have a lifelong uh, antagonistic relationship with money for all my life. I have never had money. I've always hated money. Really, I've always hated it. Uh, I always thought that it was an unreasonable requirement, money was. And uh, to the extent that I could articulate it. I had a, uh, I, ha- I hated money. I didn't like it. Didn't want it around me. Didn't want to deal with it. I just wanted to, to, for it to go away. And David, David, of course, has psychoanalyzed me. <laughs> and, uh, and determined what anybody, anybody with a, a great assault could see, and that is that I was, for all my life, a very serious uh, antisocial personality type. And all, which is the case, you know, it's just the case. It's, not so much anymore. I mean, look at me now. <laughs> look at me now, Ma. <laughs> and he also identified this issue around money and is, has been uh, uh, very uh, determined to, to try to make me see the importance of trying to get more money because if we don't have money, we're not going to make this work. But he see, saw that that was an aspect of my personality, that kind of uh, neurotic, reactive relationship with money. That's just to set the stage. To I'm trying to demonstrate to you that I really do, all my life long, have had a hatred of money, and have never ever. I had a rational relationship with money in my life. It used to be, and because of the fact that I was like that, it used to be that financial crises, although that's actually giving it a much more highfalutin name than it deserves, but, you know, where I ran out of money and didn't have any check, any bad checks to write or any any uh, any th- anybody I could steal from or anything like that, and the police and the bill collectors and the landlord were bearing down upon me, which was not an uncommon occurrence in the old days. I would uh, my 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 strategy of choice was to depart, to vacate the premises and go somewhere else and start all over again, and I could feel this kind of nauseous uh, uh, misery in my body as money began to run out. And as I could see, my God, I'm, I, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm gonna, and then I'd pick up and go steal something, get some bad credit cards or something, run bad credit cards. This was many years ago. But it happened again and again. 
And then, of course, I finally went to the joint and that problem did, <laughs> didn't bother me so much. But in the time that Carl and I have been together, we have from time to time, and not, not, not that uncommonly, come to the same pass, except minus the, the bad checks and the credit cards and the, you know, the gambling and all that stuff that used to be the means whereby I created these crises. But we would come to the same pass. I mean, we weren't. I, I, when, when, uh, when we first got together. We did not want to become spiritual teachers. We did not want to do this. We wanted to find a life where we could just earn a living and live our lives. And Carla is a uh, is an extremely accomplished translator, uh, as a professional translator, and uh, I have acquired a considerable uh, foundation of skillfulness and understanding of uh, computer technology and quickly picked up the whole business about the web and and uh, writing HTML and doing all that stuff too once I got out of the prison. So we tried everything. We had Sherman Translations, a translations company that uh, went nowhere and mostly because things are changing in the whole world of translation. Things aren't as they used to be. We started a web design business called North Bay Webs, it was in uh, uh, Northern California, in Marin. And uh, this was right at the crest of the dot-com boom, which means it was right at the beginning of the fall. And so that didn't go anywhere. We, we were encouraged by a number of people to come and do satsang, and we started doing that because there didn't seem to be anything else we could do. Really. And of course, since we weren't really trying to get rich or anything, the money that comes from traveling around the country uh, doing satsang without making an effort to promote yourself and become, you know, write books and do all that, the income from the donations of satsang are pretty meager. So we, it's not, wasn't uncommon, it wasn't unknown to us to come up upon the same circumstance that in the past had caused an outbreak of neurotic, reactive, oh my God, get me out of here, in me. And that just didn't happen anymore. The, the financial problems would come, we would find a way to solve them or to get past them, and although I felt the same uh, kind of nauseating anxiety about it, it didn't have the effect on my behavior that it used to have. It was just something that was there. It stayed for a while and then it went. And we worked on solving our, our financial problems and paying our rent and so forth as best as we could get by. And I remember, and this is, leads me up, this is a very long shaggy dog story, I'm afraid, but it leads me up to another example of the way things just disappear and you don't even know that they have gone. The way things that have been like so powerful that they have driven you and driven the direction you take with your life and driven the relationship with everything just vanish and you don't even know they're gone. We were living here, it was, I guess it was our must have been our first year here in Ojai. And we were living downtown uh, in a house on Fulton Street. And uh, it was, uh, it was, actually it must have been, it must have been 2001, sometime, I think it was probably sometime in the summer, or early fall, before seven, before 9-11. But we were broke. Couldn't pay the rent, didn't know where it was going to come from, didn't have any idea how we were going to appease the landlord or how we were going to pay the bills that were pending or what we were going to do at all. We were just broke. No money. No prospects. 
And I was standing out in the night time, looking at the sky, and it hit me that this is exactly the circumstance that had always produced in, the, in me in the past this nauseating misery, this kind of ball of misery in my chest and throat. And it suddenly hit me that, well, that's not there. Where did it go? And that was the first time that I had noticed that that particular defining characteristic of my personality had just departed, had vanished, although it had been gone for some time. And that's the way this work unfolds. That's the way the healing unfolds. Things that were previously powerful, uh, negative, and, uh, and disruptive, and distorting influences on life that were, that were so big and so, so present and so immutable, unchangeable, unmovable. Just gone. Never noticed them leaving. <laughs> Don't know where they went to. Just gone. That's the results. That's what happens. The things that were previously present in your consciousness as aspects of your personality, as part of the psychological apparatus of your relationship with the world, the things that were, that are unhealthy, that are symptoms of the illness, the, and, uh, the fear of life itself. Just don't come anymore. When they're summoned, they don't come. Other things come, new ways of relating to things, new ways of, of uh, seeing things, new points of view, new lights to see them in and so forth that are more consistent with sanity and uh, uh, intelligence. But old ones just go away. Much like the case in pretty much any, the course of the recovery from any disease. The symptoms disappear. When the disease is cured, the symptoms disappear. It's not that some new um, world of wellness and, and health have, have banished the symptoms that, that are gone now. It's not that something new came along to make them go away. It's just that they go. It's like when you have some infectious disease and take antibiotics. You take the antibiotics, you don't know what they're doing. I mean, really, you couldn't possibly, unless you're a molecular biologist and, or, and a chemist on top of it, be able to ex explicate the, the deep things that are going on within the body when the antibiotics are at work, the way in which they interact with the antibodies and interact with the, uh, the, the invading organism itself, what happens to them, where that goes, what, what happens to the tissue and the rest of the body as the, as the invading organism begins to pass away. You don't know anything about that. You just take the antibiotics, and as time passes, the symptoms begin to vanish. And when they're all gone, it's very difficult even to call them back to mind. What it felt like then, when I was feverish, when I was nauseous, when I was aching, shivering, full of pain, misery. That's why I speak of the looking as medicine rather than as anything else. 
a teaching or a doctrine or or something, some uh, understanding or some insight. Insights come that are healthy when the symptoms disappear. But the symptoms just disappear. And it is often some time before you notice that they're gone. So you look at the relationship with your life. You look and see to what extent it is still the case that you are interrogating every phenomena that rises within your consciousness to find out what it portends for you, whether it is threatening and dangerous or or, or enhancing and uh, enriching or, in, or things that are indifferent and have no, no, uh, no interest to you whatsoever. Of course, many of those things are, turn out to be extremely interesting once you stopped ignoring them. Okay? I guess that's all I have to say. Anybody want to talk to me? Yell at me? Argue with me? Okay. Uh, Mike. Hi, Mike. How's My going? pleasure. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. <clears throat> um, earlier today, people were talking about anxiety. And um, to go back a little bit, um, you had some prerequisite reading some that you would have liked me to have read, but I uh, you know, unfortunately downloaded the wrong one. And, <laughs> and it was a transcript of the, um, of the retreat itself. So I, re- I almost read the whole thing, but towards the end of it, I actually felt like I was here. It was, it was really, it was very That was the book, Look at Yourself, right? Yes. The one that I discouraged anybody from spending their money on. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I found it very entertaining and it was very beneficial. It's, it's a good but I did, I did start looking before that and I have experimented with that type of uh, thing, but not in a simplified version because I, yeah, I appreciate um, your hands-on simplified version of this because you know I've, like everybody else I guess probably in the room they've been chasing an outcome of some kind right um, which does or doesn't come I, I guess we wouldn't be here if it had already come <laughs> but, that's right but I you know I started looking and I found myself wanting to look more and it was it was amazing it was it like you said it was it happens like in a tenth of a second you know mm-hmm. it, it's it's There's pretty, not much to it. It's pretty incredible. <laughs> but I found myself having anxiety myself that I hadn't really noticed before after a few days after I started. And it was an unusual anxiety. And I I, I kind of came to the conclusion that it was an anxiety that was already always there. <laughs> but that I just didn't notice. Yeah. I think, I think and, and I, I thought this too when I'm, I was uh, speaking to... Uh, Ava this morning that it, it, and I, I didn't want to say this because I don't want like I don't want to talk people out of you know the idea that they're feeling bad right I, I really don't want to talk people out of that but from my from my own experience I've come to conclude that 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 you call anxiety is actually the life force that's what it is yeah. and it's energetic you know and it's present all the time it's yeah. not it's not like a neurotic anxiety that comes and goes. It was an interesting feeling, and it's it's gotten better. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for being here. Thank you for your time. Oh, you're very welcome. I'm <laughs> glad to it. meet you. I'm glad you brought that up. I've, I've been thinking ever since I talked to Ava that I wanted to find a way to suggest that anxiety is the life force, and there it comes, see? It's magic. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Yeah. Hi. Hi. Do I know your name? Hamsa. 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 Mm-hmm. Have I spoken to you before? Briefly outside uh, when I was very Oh, right. Time. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I thought so. Um, I really just wanted to come up here for this personal moment. Um, I saw you when you were in Boulder some years ago, and you found it to be a profound satsang. I, Must have been the escape from the spiritual ghetto, mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> yeah. It was a large crowd. Yeah, a large crowd, mm-hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. 
And since then, I've been with another teacher pretty intensely. And um, during that time, was listening to your recordings maybe two years ago and found what you were saying to ring true to me and heard some people's experiences along with it. But then I shared it with this teacher and they were just like, <laughs> told me to drop it yeah, and yeah. um so i did <laughs> but it still keeps coming back as a really um beneficial tool and just in the last couple of days i can see how simple it is oh i'm really happy to hear that mm -hmm. you know i don't uh i'm, I'm really happy to hear that I am. I don't, I don't, uh, I don't, I'm not in competition with anything. Mm -hmm. The truth of the matter is that, that uh, if you do this, it doesn't matter what else you're doing. Mm -hmm. It really doesn't. There's no, there's no, nothing to watch out for that you're going to make a mistake and think the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or have the wrong opinion or anything like that. All you have to do is look. Mm -hmm. It's just you. Mm -hmm. That's all. Just you. So this is good news. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've spent a lot of time enjoying satsang for the vibe of the setting, right. but also want, wanting to glean some kind of understanding right. and had that like strong desire for right. when I understand it, then I'll be That's free. right. We're, we're, right. We're, we're taught, and it's not just in the satsang circuit, it's mm -hmm. pretty much everywhere. There is an underlying sense that what's what we're lacking is a correct understanding. Mm -hmm. That if we really understood things, everything would be fine, and all we have to do is just that. But what I found is that I don't need to understand anything about me. I, I really don't. Mm -hmm. In fact, about me, there's very little to understand. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of this work has nothing to do with finding out what you are or who you are, anything of the kind. It's just the touch, just the look. Thank you. Yeah, oh. I, I came with the intention of, of dropping this obsession with switching um, information or, or, or styles of looking. I think a lot of people have a, a, another style that's more complex that might hardly ever get people there. So, thank you. So You're welcome. Good to see you. you Stay too. in touch, if you will. I will. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Somebody else was 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 it you, Jake? Wow. Good to see you again. Yeah, you too. Um, I just the first thing that comes to mind is that on my way, I was riding my bike from town. Over to here, and I passed. Didn't I see you? Was that you? It must have been. <laughs> I, I, I thought I saw you in my rear view mirror. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, that looks familiar to me. <laughs> I'm, I'm driving a rented black uh, Chevy fake PT Cruiser. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> um, <coughs> well, I passed this church on the way. And, and my whole flight over was sitting next to somebody who, like, within two minutes, she mentioned the Lord, and that's what we talked about for the whole flight. But so I passed that church on the way, um, New Wine, I think it's called, and I was like, that's it. That's what we're trying to do. You can't put new wine in old skins. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I had my notes with me. I had that on my notes, uh, and you know, it just didn't pan out. Yes, of course it is. It's new wine and old wine skins. Right. That's exactly the case, and that's exactly what he was referring to. Exactly. He, he was trying to break a brand paradigm new, too. and he yeah. isn't saying that the old wine is bad, right? Not that the old uh, Ju Judaic uh, uh, religion is bad or needs to be abandoned, but just that the that vernacular, that that context of understanding cannot hold this new wine. The old wine skin is brittle and will burst in, in, when it comes in contact with it. Ah, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> See, this stuff happens all the time, too. <laughs> um, and then just 
I don't have any, you know, great news, but I just thought I'd, for posterity's sake, I'd just say what's what's going on because later when I can call you and say, hey, I've lost the fear of life, you know, people can see what I had to go through. Yes, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> Of course, you could just skip to that part. <laughs> I'm lying, though. Um, but I think I first got a look at myself in, it was 2002 or 2003, I think, and I was on a meditation retreat, and um, I was thinking about my mother, you know, it, during meditation, and then I just went, do I have a mother? And <laughs> and that's what made me, uh -huh. I, I was like, oh, I... I I don't have a mother, Let, you know, and, um, but I didn't have the instruction to keep right. looking there. I did have the instruction to feel, to stay with the felt sense of being here, which is actually what you're saying, isn't it? Well, it's a little abstract. That saying that? Yeah. Yeah, because I didn't abstract. really, I only uh, would do it if I was on a retreat. You know, I say, I, I say that you should look at me, I call it you, but you should look at me because that's the closest I can get to a to an unabstract uh, pronoun that points to what it is I want you to look at, and you know there are there's many uh, places where they talk about things and what they're encouraging you to do may well be to look at you, but the language the the old wineskins just can't can't get to that. It's just not has nothing to do with intelligence or intention or anything of the kind. It's just the old wineskin, and it just can't get to that. But So yes, it is similar, but it's too abstract. Right. Um, it's like, who am I is abstract. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, it can, that I can use that if I'm like stuck in something and I can say, well, who's afraid, what is afraid of this? And that'll take me back down to the source of that. And then I can look at myself like, but only because. Because you've I've, already I've consciously figured it out. looked, yeah. Yeah. When you used to say to me, who's, well, who's, who's looking for that? I'd just be like, what are you talking about? <laughs> you know, <it> just, <laughs> I am. <laughs> <laughs> But if I you if I know what I'm doing and I use yeah, it like right. that, I can do that. Um, but so I guess so, and then I don't know how much is a result of the looking and how much is just a natural maturation of having a spiritual path for your whole adult life, you know. But so then I you know I dropped any kind of trying to fix myself and all that, and then and then and then I got married, and so then I was like living with people, and I. I just felt like, like lately in the last couple of years, it's just been like, okay, I'm still looking at myself, but I'm still, you know, I'm not done, or what, I forget how we're supposed to say it, but you know what I mean. <laughs> <laughs> not supposed to say it anyway. <laughs> and I, you know, I have to find a way to be with these people where I'm not being homicidal inside, you know. Mm -hmm. So I, so I picked back up some old tools, like I. I do NVC because the guy who started nonviolent communication, the guy who started that, he completely has lost the fear of life. That's what I like about him. But he just has this other way of talking about it. And then I go to 12 step stuff and I can't quite go, you know, over to a higher power because I, I kind of know, you know, I mean, from I, it works as a metaphor, but anyway. So, like, that's what I'm doing. I'm, like, doing both. I'm looking at myself, and then I'm using, like, tools for the mind to help me um, Get by. just be, yeah, yeah. civil, you know, yeah. and, that's, and, and have some integrity, you know. Yeah, and that, the, the using those things can't be of any harm to you, really. I encourage you to continue doing that. I also would like you to reflect upon the possibility that having homicidal urges toward the idiots that are around you and, <laughs> and so forth, that that really isn't a problem. Uh -huh. It's just an internal experience. And uh, that's all it is. It's an internal experience wanting to kill somebody because they're so stupid or they're, they deserve to die or whatever. Right? <laughs> <coughs> and and it's, a, it's an interesting thing to see 
that that really is not a problem. That it comes, and 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 I'm I'm not I am continuing to encourage you to continue doing what you're doing to deal with the the effects of the arising of that kind of uh, uh, phenomenon, right? But you also can reflect and see that it is just a feeling. It's just an experience with a, a lot of uh, understanding around it and, you know, like where it comes from, what it means, so forth and so on, because of all the work you've done on yourself. But it's just a feeling. It's just a sensation. It has appeared and then it disappears. It's just that there must be a, a lot of resistance to the sensation or something that comes up at the same time yeah, because there's so much right. energy in it. Well, of course it does, yeah. yeah. That, that's a... They're coupled, you know. They're, it's the whole. It's like a uh, psychological love match, you know, or a hate love match. Mm-hmm. The the sensation of this sense of really wanting to see somebody vanish from the face of the earth because they they just don't deserve to be here. Well, life yeah. would just be so much easier without like mean people. Yeah, yeah it would be. Wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 that I select. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, you're the only one qualified. <laughs> but it's just a sensation. That's all it is. And it really is not the problem. It's a symptom of the problem. As is the resistance to it, a symptom of the problem. And there are a number of techniques that can be brought into play to deal with such things as resistance and and as you're familiar with, homicidal urges or, you know, whatever kind of urges come and so forth. There are a lot of, uh, of techniques in play for dealing with those kind of things. And I encourage people to use them freely. I mean, why wouldn't you? Why, you know, if you have a headache, take an aspirin. If you know a way to relieve some uh, uh, neurotic thing that is troubling you, do it. Relieve it. It'll come back, but relieve it. And uh, and in the end, the time will come when it just doesn't come back anymore. Not because of the the palliative effect of the other work, but because your relationship with it will be just completely changed. Your relationship with your life will be completely changed, and the the set of assumptions and understandings and history and so forth that have given rise to that particular response to certain stimuli, that they just go away. In the meantime, take an aspirin. Really. Yeah, that's kind of what I have been left with. Because I don't know how long how long it's going to take, you know. Like, so. I don't either. <laughs> um, and <clears throat> the other thing is, so I was sitting next to this woman on the plane, and um, she asked me what I was where I was going, what I was doing. She had just come from a strategic planning on how to get Christian, the Christian message out to rock and punk festivals and stuff. <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's fertile ground there. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, just play me the music, like the Christian rock stuff. <laughs> um, but, so I... I can't, I, you can't say, I, I will not, I, I'm not going to say to someone, oh, I'm going to look at myself, because it just sounds not. like we're going to look in the mirror. Sounds or, ridiculous. Yeah, anyway, like, yeah. and I'm, or, and I'm not going to say, oh, I, I look at me, because that makes no sense, and um, so what I said was, um, well, I'm going on a retreat, like a meditation retreat, and she's like, oh, what are you going to be meditating on? And I said, um... <laughs> I said I was going to be um, looking at the part of me that never changes, that's always here. I'm like, you know, the, the part that's the same since you were little. She's like, yeah, I know what you're talking about. And she goes, oh, yeah, Brother Lawrence wrote a book about that in 1666. And Who? Brother Lawrence, she said he was a monk that was a dishwasher at the monastery, and then people started to notice, you know, that he was exuding joy and love and and so people started to come to him and they transcribed his what he was talking about and what he called it i can't remember the name of the book but the practice of the presence of god yeah he called it looking at the presence of god 
And, you know, that's fine with me. Like, if I were talking to someone who had God as their uh, understanding of what is reality, then I would just say I practice looking at the presence of God. Like, I mean, You could do that, as long as you're not doing it in order to communicate anything useful to the person. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, really, and I'm not, I'm not uh, uh, disparaging. That's what they that. understand is their internal. Right, and and that's that's there's as long as you don't think you're communicating something useful, that's fine. Uh, and I don't mean that, you know, sarcastically. I mean that sincerely. Uh, we have to be, you know, part of the natural state of human existence is consideration for others. You know, just just plain, simple consideration for others. And when we are neurotic and antagonistic, we are much more likely to say something like, well, I'm looking at myself. It, precisely because of the fact that it will cause confusion and some difficulty with the person you're talking to. But it's naturally human to be considerate of others and to be considerate of the circumstance and the context in which, you know, your interaction with people is taking place. And I think to say that you're looking at the presence of God is perfectly okay, as long as you're not trying to give them something that is going to actually help them. That's fine. I don't mean that... You see, I don't mean when I say, as long as you're not trying to do something that will help them, I'm not saying that it's bad to not be doing something to try to help them. I'm just saying don't confuse yourself into thinking that that will lead them to what you are actually doing. Right. Well, she got it when I said what I was actually looking at. Right. But the thing is, because I'm not... <clears throat> because, I, you know, I just feel like... Because you said it directly. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, well I'm just saying until... Um, you know, um, until my fear of life is gone, I, you know, I don't really talk about it to anybody no. because what do I have to, sh to show for it? Like, right. No. You could be like me. That's you right. know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Aha, how do you like that, Maples? <laughs> I'll tell you something else, Jane. If you will start going to the forums just to read them you'll find a place where that kind of conversation is taking place in an environment that is uh, that is open to anything that's, that's said and that sees it within the context of this work. And that can be that can be quite helpful. This is you know, we're not in this alone. Right. We're all in this together. And just having that kind of uh, uh, access to a community of people who are in the same activity as you are can be helpful and helpful in a lot of ways yeah i mean like just going to dinner last night was helpful yeah. just to be able to finally oh we all know what we're talking about right right exactly um so do that you know go i did read the all the like reports the three, all the yeah and so it seemed like reports. half the people were done with the fear of life and half were just reporting where that how they've yeah. gone so far yeah, and yeah. which is which is great, you know. That's what I mean. We're not looking for cherry picked reports. We're looking for actual human uh, experience of what's happening in their lives. And then just the other thing that the thing that struck me, or one, I mean, there's one of the things is that where I am right now, I can't really say like this is the only thing. It's the only thing that works for me that I or that I can seem to consistently stick to. But, you know, just the other night at a 12-step meeting, there was this guy talking whose, whose daughter had been killed horribly. And he pretty much said exactly what you just said. He's like, pain comes and then it goes and I'm still here. And, you know, it's just a feeling and I'm fine. And because for him, it's about a connection with a higher power. It's just about not having living life to his own, with by his, the force of his willpower, and like I see people like that who get there other ways. Like a friend who worked worked in a hospice for years, and she's like, "I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of death. I'm not afraid of life." It's like 
I, I just think there's probably other ways. It's just that this is the way for me. Here's what I think about that. Mm-hmm. I think there are other ways. But I think that they are not... Uh, and, and I think there are other ways within the spiritual teachings also. Most, most notably within the rubric of self-inquiry. But also other kinds of things that people do within the spiritual uh, adventure. But the thing is that that, those other ways are ways that worked in an extremely idiosyncratic manner. Like, it just so happens that that there is a certain uh, character type that will hear something that other character types won't hear. And within that population of uh, character types, within that population, maybe one of them will accidentally stumble onto what is actually being called for in the spiritual suggestions, right? And stumble onto the natural state. And it's also possible that people can stumble onto the natural state outside of the spiritual realm. That I have never argued with. The only thing about all of that that I take it, that I that I want, that I think it's really useful to see is that very few have stumbled onto the natural state as a result of following any path whatsoever. Very few. And it's not, that's not like a, um, a, a, you know, I didn't just pull that out of my ear, right? You can just look around and see how meager are the number of people who are naturally absent of the fear of life. You look at the world, seven billion of us, look at it. And it's the same with the progression of the spiritual teachings, <coughs> the wisdom teachings over the 5,000 years that they have been a part of our lives. Obviously, during that period of time, there have been a number of people following a spiritual path of one kind or another who have stumbled on the natural state. Sometimes it happens even without following a spiritual path, as in the case of Ramana. He wasn't following a spiritual path. He stumbled on the natural state in a response to the rising of a neurotic fear of death and his response to that. So it's not that this is the only thing that can possibly bring somebody to the natural state of being human. It's just that this is the only thing that can be counted upon to do that with, so far as I can tell, at least the vast majority of humanity. I'll tell you what I think the difference is between what you're saying and other people who say almost the same thing. Like, I, my my yoga teacher that I found in Minneapolis, a Iyengar yoga teacher, all he, he puts us in a pose where we don't have to do anything, really. We can just lie there or sit there. And then he starts saying, look at, he really literally says, look at yourself. Look at now, not what you normally take to be yourself, not all your thoughts, but what is it that's looking at the thoughts? Now start looking there, and the, and he'll do that for two hours. That it's totally the same thing. Might be you know he has a different background, different vocabulary, but the difference is that he's not making a point about it. Like he's mm-hmm. like people are going there to do headstand, you know, like right. n- no, so they don't know what they're going for. And you're, so the difference to me is that you're saying, look, this will do this for you. And these are all the promises. And that, that to me is why, is what's different. One of the big things. It's, uh, yes, right. I think you're right. I mean, uh, when, when you're speaking about a small group of, of expressions that are, that basically are suggesting the same thing. I think you're right. It's it has to do with uh, the fact that I'm out there trying to get people to yeah. do it. I mean, and, granted, there were only two people in the class, and, even though he's like one of the best right. teachers in the country, because people don't right. want to. And hear and it. Uh, well, uh, just give me a minute, okay? Sometimes it slips my mind. <clears throat> my my so-called mind. Yeah. 
It's the intention. It's the intention that's different. The intention, in a, I mean, even if you're, even if you are uh, trying to get out there and tell people that this is that to do this, to lay down and look at yourself and so forth. It's the, to me, what has seemed consistently different that never, I haven't seen anywhere else, is the insistence that there is an intention involved here. That when you turn your attention to look at yourself, because I am encouraging you to do so, it's not in order that you will get relaxed and comfortable. It's not in order that anything at all in particular will happen. There is nothing to it except the act of looking. So, and, and, and it's you. It's the personal pronoun you. It's the person you. It's not, um, anything else. It's just you. And that intention and that specificity, I think, is a big difference. And I think the intention makes all the difference. And I've said that a lot, and people who have been through this have said that a lot. It's the intention that's the different. The intention to look rather than the intention than the intention to look so you can be free from the right. misery of life. Well yes, exactly, yes. Isn't that why people do it though? So that they can Well sure, but that's why people get high too. And right. it works for a while. Right? No, really, I'm I'm serious. Yeah. That's why people get high. That's why uh, people go skiing. That's why why the people engage in all those activities. Everything people do, do is done in an attempt to ease the burden of being human. You know everything. Uh, the things that are done that are not directly associated with that are seen to be drudgery and uh, and things that need to be done with, like going to work every day or. Or uh, you know, washing the dishes, or you know, there seem to be drudgery. When in truth, they're not. They're actually quite magnificent uh, things. So yeah, right. That's why people do it all, and and that desire to feel better. There's nothing wrong with the desire to feel better. It's the desire to feel better that has brought people to me. Nothing wrong with that desire, but that desire is entirely um, settled on the, the way the life is. In other words, it's entirely a matter of ending my resistance to things that I shouldn't resist, ending my grasping of things that I shouldn't grasp, ending my ignorance of my own nature, like in other words, reforming the mind. And and that doesn't work. I could tell you to look at yourself, and if I tell you if you look at yourself, then your mind will all get clear and everything will be okay, that wouldn't work. It really wouldn't. It wouldn't work? It wouldn't make me look at myself? It, it, might, it might or might not make you mm-hmm. try to look at yourself, but the... I don't think it would. I don't think it would allow you to actually have the direct experience of the simplicity of your nature. You know, you're you're too, not you, but one is too, and and not intentionally in any way whatsoever, but just too seated in the sense that it's life that's the problem. It's the way I'm living my life. It's the way life is living. It's coming to me. The way I it's. It's experienced by me. It's all about the life being the problem, which, of course, is a direct consequence of the underlying primary uh, cause of it all, which is the fear of life itself. Um, that's maybe related to something else. I was just going to clarify. Like, I think I don't know if David was talking about this or not, but when so when I look at myself, I see that you know that that I've never been hurt, or um, I want to say that part of me, because that is what it feels like. It's like there's a part of me that's never been hurt. Never it feels that way because, and yeah. it feels that way because you, you have to focus into right. a, a particular area. Yeah. Um, but, and I, I don't, it's, I'm just checking to see if this is what you were talking about this morning, but um, 
unfortunately, like just seeing that doesn't mean that. Well, now I'm not afraid because I see that I don't. That's get right. right. That's right. <laughs> That's exactly what I was saying this morning. Right. You know, it is the case, and when I say look at yourself and I describe you as that which has never been touched or moved or changed or done anything or had anything done to it, it's not in order to and it's and but but it's okay. But it's not in order to bring you to a place where you're you're. Um, where you feel better about your life. It's in order to describe what it is I want you to touch with your attention. And uh, you're right. That's exactly right. Yeah. Um, and then just to distinguish, um, so there's looking at yourself, and then I think on the first day, or this first morning, you were talking about um, like that, the feeling inside, or I would, I like the word felt sense, that that, like there's a sensation that you can actually feel. Um, so is that like putting my attention on that? Is that different from looking at myself to you? Didn't I say that as part of the description of you? There is a feeling tone, a sensation that you can actually feel. Wasn't I saying that's what you feel like? Uh, I, I just <coughs> know when I say to myself, I'm. If, if I'm going to look at myself, say I like see my bracelet and it reminds me to look at myself, then it's more like I have pupils on the back of my eyes. Oh, yes. That's, that's, that's common, too. Yeah. Um, but if I say, oh, what does that feel like to be here or to be myself, then it's more, it's lower in my body, kind of, almost seems like. Yeah. Just like Mark. Mm -hmm. huh? Yeah. The yeah. guy... Okay. A guy who uh, has had a very extremely uh, uh, difficult life, extremely difficult life, and uh, has had some very extreme. And he wrote about this in his report, so I has had some very extreme things happen to him. He had uh, he was manic depressive, bipolar, and manic depressive, and uh, it was so bad that uh, they ended up giving him uh, ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, which really shocked me. I thought that was back in the dark ages, but it turns out that apparently that therapy can be the, the, th the only thing that actually will work in a severely afflicted manic depressive, and that it actually works pretty well in most. It didn't work for him. And that's a very rare thing for it not to work. Didn't work for him, made it worse. And, uh, and that's the way he describes the way in which that he finally was able to look at himself was as he turned his eyes inside out so the pupils were facing backwards. And, uh, and he's thriving now. I mean, he's, uh, he's doing well. Cool. Yeah. So. <laughs> and just one other thing I want to mention is that there's this book that I read like a year ago called The Brain That Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. And and it's all this research from the 10, you know, most cutting edge neuroscientists right now. And I, it's hard to imagine anyone reading that book and then still being able to believe that anything that you can see or touch or feel or sense is is what is where it's at. Like, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> because it's all it's all just mechanical. It's all made up. All yeah, mechanical. it's all well all. biological. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, bi biology is mechanical. Yeah. I mean, mechanical doesn't mean right. But it's all mechanical. It's a mechanical process. It's part of the whole cause and effect uh, uh, business of the way that that sensation is is experienced and acquired by different uh, uh, neuron places and so forth and so on. I have a very uh, uh, insignificant sense of what's happening in the realm of, uh, of this of, of brain science. And, you know, it's interesting, too. I had somebody send me... Uh, 
a clip, a, a YouTube clip. I think it was YouTube, uh, one of them, YouTube or Blip or something, of a brain scientist. And uh, I hope I can do this justice. Uh, he he is very soft and uh, and smart and, uh, and and full of life and at peace and calm and clearly the fear of life is absent from him clearly. But what he suggests that people do, and I can't quite remember it, but it's just not quite it. It's still within that realm of doing something to make the way I live my life different than it is. The way I, to make, to a direct movement of trying to see life differently than I see it now. But it would, and it's, God, I wish I hadn't brought it up now because it's really quite a beautiful thing. And I, I'll talk about it again tomorrow. I'll, I'll look at it and bring it back, back to our attention tomorrow. But and the interesting thing about it is that I see it, and I see that what he's talking about is exactly what I'm talking about. But he really doesn't offer any access to that in the things that he suggests. In the you know the way that he suggests going about, which is pretty much the norm with. But it's interesting he he figured it out from. It's yeah. like a process of elimination when you right. realize what's going on with the brain if there is a brain. Even. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> it's a pleasure, Jane. <laughs> did you know that? Uh, did you know that? Uh, Freud was of the opinion that it was the birth trauma that... Uh, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but see, Freud lived in Austria, where they have these horrible traumatic births. Are you aware? He didn't that live they're... in Brazil, where they just squat. <laughs> they just come out, and they just put them on their chest. It's just and, but no, but I told you about my daughter's birth, like underwater, I know, I know. no trauma. And, like, and maybe yeah. there wasn't any. How yeah. do I know? You know, there are human beings who are not afflicted. There are human beings who are not But Freud was afflicted. studying like horrible. Like, I just say that to say Western. It was very. He's Western. not the only one. There are a number of philosophical opinions about this. I didn't know it until I, I had no idea that anybody had ever thought about this before, until I I hit upon it myself in the course of doing this work. But there's a whole philosophical uh, subsection almost about the origins of the fear of life and and uh, signal anxiety and all of those things. And uh, there's a, uh, it's a controversial matter. I can't words, wait, because John, when I'm done with the fear of life, that's going to be my life's work. Well, I'm not probably. asking you to no, read it at all. No, I'm, tell- I'm no, just I'm, defending no, I'm gonna, myself no, to you. <laughs> I'm telling you, I'm going to be working with small... I already like work with mothers trying to get them to respect their babies as humans, but... But I'm going to be. I'm going to be, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be and, doing and avoid it. homicidal urges. <laughs> I, I don't really do it that much. I just kind of I have yeah. the training, and I don't. Oh right, really I'm, do I'm it. not suggesting it. No, I'm, but I once I stop hating women who drop their two week olds off in gym nurseries, I will be doing that. <laughs> and, and um, and we'll see. You know, like yeah. what happens I'll with see. babies who have, who who don't get that put in them from the beginning. I'd be interested in saying that. I mean, I know that there are human beings who are not afflicted, but they are few and far between, really. And most of them, I suspect, don't uh, make their presence known. Because being being in a community of people who are steeped in misery causes misery. I mean, it's not neurotic misery anymore. It's just like discomfort, right? So, there are few and far between. Yeah, it's like in some cold places in Europe. Like you, can't, yes. you can't be happy because it pisses people off. Like, <laughs> that we're all freezing and miserable, and how could you be happy? And you have to like not. Smile. That's right. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to spend time with you. <laughs> yes, it's nice to spend time with you. Okay. Give my love to uh, Giles and Lakshmi. Giles and Lakshmi. Lakshmi. Yeah. I knew that, but thank you for helping.
Yes. That was nice. I enjoyed that. See, that's what I mean. This is the conversation we need to be having as human beings. Not a conversation about what's our next uh, therapeutic measure or, or when are we going to go get laid or when are we going to go get drunk <laughs> or when am I going to get rich or when will the dirty, stinking capitalists go away? You know? But this kind of conversation about what it is to be human. Hi. Hi. How are you? Esther? Pat. Pat. Wow, that's about as far from Esther as you can get. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Pat. Hi, John. Um, just a little reminder that um, we've met several times before. I, I know that. You know, I, I recognize your face yeah. and your your body and everything. It's just the name sometimes eludes yeah. me. It, and because it's from it's Ashland and it's from Streets in Ashland. Pat Ryder. Pat Ryder. Ah, oh, that's it. Yes. No wonder I was confused. I just could see you very clearly, but I haven't seen yeah. you for a long time. Yeah. So it, it feels so just wonderful to be with you again. Oh, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. And Carla, too. Um, I just want to say that for me, um, you as a teacher in the Advaita strain, that um, I always respected so much that you were very ordinary. Organized. Ordinary. To me, ordinary, all oh, right, ordinary, ordinary yes. Yeah. And simple and um, clear about talking about uh, the truth in satsang and also very extraordinary. Mm-hmm. So something about you right now, it's like just you've, ta- you've taken a direction, a new direction, but that quality of simplicity and going for the truth and the ordinariness of it is still, for me, it still touches my heart. Well, I'm happy to hear that. Yeah. I, I, it seems that I've gone in a new direction, but what has really happened is I finally found what it was I was looking for, which is a way to express what I see to be the case. Yeah. And that's what I was trying to do in all those sets on meetings. And just wasn't able to and wanted to be as uh, human as possible with everybody I was around. Yeah. Because we're in this together. Yeah. So I haven't been uh, participating in um, retreats or meditation or all of those things that I immersed myself in for probably a good 10-year period. In the last four years... It's a good sign. Yeah. For the last four years, I've just been living my life. That's good. That's good. So... um, I'm surprised to be here, and it was like um, a friend gave me your book, Shanti gave me your book, and I I read it, and I got the gist that you were on a new trajectory, but I think when I arrived, I was still in a state of shock. The, so what? A state of shock, uh-huh. because I had only known you right. from the ancient wisdom teachings. Right, right, yeah. yes. So I think that um, I'm trying still to kind of work it out. I notice that my mind is trying to kind of see the, the truth, the thread of truth that runs through this trajectory and the thread of truth that I remember from the Advaita. And so I did a little experiment because I thought that inquiry to ask, who am I? I couldn't see the difference between who am I and looking for the me. Well, are you able, by asking the question, who am I, to get a direct experience of of what it actually feels like to be you? Well, you know... Which is very very fleeting. Right. I thought I did until you presented it. And during this workshop, I've actually stopped and I've done the experiment. So the experiment of inquiry, which leaves me empty. Okay. Yeah. Just like no thing. Just right, right. throws me back into nothing. Which I value, have valued. Yes, yes. Yeah. And then I've tried the um, suggestion of looking for the me or looking at myself. And it's a very different quality. 
Yes, it is a very different quality. Yeah. And so I'm a little shocked at that. Ah, good. That's yeah, good. I'm a little glad. shocked at that. And wondering how in the Advaita tradition, when we were looking and suggested that we look for that which never changes, then that feels to me like the same thing as looking at the me. It seems though that it seems to me that any abstraction like it's true that I tell you or I tell people when I encourage them to look for what it feels like to be the actual person, I point out to them that what they're looking for doesn't change. So I still now, as it has always been, it's never been hurt or helped by anything. Yeah. But I'm not asking them to look for that. I'm asking them to look for the person that they are, the person that underlies it all, and then describing that person. If I say, look for that which never com- never comes and goes, that which is always the same, that which doesn't move, and so forth and yeah. so on, then the only thing that happens there is that that inquiry gets hijacked by my understanding. What is it that never moves? What is it that is unchanging? What is it that, that doesn't uh, come or go? Well, it's self, or it's consciousness, or it's awareness. And it, the, the uh, conversation may not complete itself like that, but that's just the context in which that naturally ends up. But when you start with me, you can't get from me to Advaita Vedanta. You can't, to the the understandings of Advaita Vedanta. Uh It's the personal pronoun, and I tell you that it was Ramana (coughs) who himself got kind of hijacked by spiritual understanding, he steeped himself in that. I heard you say that. Yes, but it was Ramana who first, who f- from whom I first heard that idea. And when I first heard it, it shocked me. The idea of... Ramana, when, in his report of what happened to him when he pretended to be dead, yeah. in his report he says, all that remains is the force of personality. Quite something that that's quite that, something, isn't it? Isn't it? Yeah. And that's the hint mm-hmm. that that I followed to get here with you, sitting right here with you. Well, th- I appreciate um, you telling me this, although <coughs> you, you've said this a few times, but I think I've just heard it, <coughs> yeah. uh, that it is a personal me. Yes. Yeah. Right. That's yeah. the difference. Yeah. And that's the, that's the critical difference. Yeah. I'm convinced of it. Yeah. You know... Um, I have some memories of myself as a child, and they are so direct and so pure, and just a child that was just golden and open-hearted and just so connected in my heart. And I have been trying that on to help me remember. Yes, and the, the thing is, when you get when you remember an event from your childhood, just for a second, see if you can. Remember what it felt like to be you. Yeah. And you'll instantly see that that's exactly what it feels like to be you now. Yeah. Okay? I'll play with that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, John. Well, I'm so happy you came. Oh, uh, yeah. You really snagged me when you told me you had a vision to influence <laughs> humanity. <clears throat> yes. Well, this that's is a, a time a when pretty we... outrageous thing to. Yeah. Yeah. To, uh, but the propose. time is now. It has to, it, you know, it's yeah. now or never. Yeah. It seems really clear. Yeah, for me too. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. I'm so happy you came. Give my yeah. love to Shanti and everybody up there. I will, and Joni, as uh, I was leaving, she sent me an email. She said, tell John I love him. Same back. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you, Pat. guess we have time for another one. If there is another one to be had. <laughs> Helen? You look like you you want a box or something. You want a box? (laughs) (laughs) Well, I just wanted to test out walking up because um, it still moves me.
but I can stand. And I'm not cringing inside. Hmm. That's my report. That's perfect report. I love you. I'm really happy you're here in this adventure with us. And I'm very happy that you uh, did that. I, I, I would never go by air from here to Australia. <laughs> uh, I just can't imagine a more, <laughs> a less, you know, pleasant way to spend, what, 12 or 13 hours, something like that. But I'm very happy that you can. Happy to see you and Keith here. And Sorry. Keith looks good. That I don't mean fat. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, um, <laughs> you have made my life easier in so many ways. And one of them is that you're in alignment with Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you're welcome, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> Just to stand talk, God. That thing of finding, accepting that I was looking at me as of something that didn't have to be denied. Uh as in all the spiritual things. Yes, as right. That, yes. Was, that was the ego. It was the bad thing. Yeah. And that gave me so much courage. It's, it's how it's in. It's gone now. Yeah. Ego just means I. Yeah. That's all it means. Yeah. We don't worry about ego here. Okay. Thank you, Helen. Thank you. Did you have some? Mark. Ah, Mark. Mark Angles. That's the one. From Victoria. Yes. <laughs> Jumped on a plane. Yes, and rainy day in San Diego. On a rainy day. Well, my my my. Um, I've uh, I've been exploring the uh, the depths of uh, life. This is probably the third time in the last twenty years. Uh, this is deeper than I've gone before. Uh, about a year and a half ago, I had the pleasure of experiencing the passion. Um, ten day retreat, silent, ten and a half hours of meditation. I know. The best vegetarian food I've ever eaten. Mm -hmm. It was great. Uh, this time around, however, um, I um, hmm, didn't really know what to try. I have an acquaintance who practices neurofeedback. I did that for, oh, I don't know, about 14 straight days. Uh, I think it made me a little more neurotic, actually. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just thinking it. about getting up and being there at 9 in the morning. and mm. <laughs> The smells of the house, the dogs barking at me. Um, I also started a regimen of about, well, three times a week acupuncture. Try to relax. Uh, saw a doctor, of course. Um, who declared me clinically depressed and gave me some pills, which I uh, avoided for about three days, thinking I would use something natural, which kind of worked, but it, I finally gave in. I said, you know, whatever I have to do, I'm going to do. Yeah. Um, my friend Ray uh, introduced me to your looking. Uh, he did it in the most subtle way possible because for five years I didn't hear it. Uh, and it was only this summer I started to listen, and uh, then he sent me a link to your site. Sent me a link to Muji, mm -hmm. and you. And uh, yours resonated with me, and uh, I started practicing the looking um, about 10 days ago. Um, I, I decided to come up here and talk because 
you were talking about a person named Mark. I listened to that podcast, uh -huh. and I, I forgot his name was Mark. Mm -hmm. um, I found it fascinating that he had the ECT. I have a friend who went through ECT, and actually they, did, they stopped ECT on her after about two years of three times a week. It wasn't working. Mm -hmm. They probably succeed in turning your brain into mush, but that's, that's about as far as mm -hmm. about that. Um, but he talked about, and I thought it came from you, but you said before that it came from him that he um, experienced looking as though he was turning his eyes inside out. Right, it is, yeah. That was one of the first experiences I had, so I just thought, one, I'd mention that. Two, um, I'm three and a half hours by plane from here. After ten and a half hours of excruciating airports and planes and airport food all day, I'm diabetic. It wasn't the greatest day. Uh, my response reaction to most of that day was something my wife of 30 or 5 years would probably looked at me and said, What's the matter with you? What are you on? <laughs> um, and uh, I would have only been able to say, uh, Something's different. It's a good thing. It's a good thing. I have to thank you for it. And uh, it's a good reference point from uh, where you see me now. And yeah. Hopefully you'll see something later or an email and I'll be able to describe something different. But hopefully I'm feeling a little better. That's it. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here, Mark. And uh, um, you're going to be okay. Uh, that's it, huh? That's what they all say. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but, but you already know that. Um, I sort of do. Yeah, you do. I sort of do. Yeah. I just Stay in touch, please. Takes a little while. Thank okay. you. I will. Stay in touch. Good or bad? <laughs> Go to bed. Okay. Thanks. Okay, I guess we're going to wrap it up now and get some rest. Uh, I don't have anything in particular to say. This this particular this afternoon has been uh, just one wonderful conversation after another, and this is the conversation that human beings need to be having: a conversation about what it is to be human, and what what can be done to be free of that which makes us feel that being human sucks so bad. <laughs> because it is that sense that human life sucks so bad that is the cause of everything that's happening in the world now. It's the cause of war, rape, murder, deceitfulness, greed, lust. All of that comes from the fear of life. And it will depart when the fear of life departs from humankind. So, I can't tell you, really, how grateful I am that you're here and that you're in this conversation with me and with the rest of this, the rest of us who are in this uh, remarkable adventure that has somehow appeared. I mean, it's just, Carl and I are endlessly surprised by, well, thank you. Thank you. I love you all. I'll see you in the morning, and uh, please get a good night's rest if you can. You know, it may be difficult. You never know. These, uh, th this, uh, this is such a, such a departure, and so unexpected, and so not what anybody would think of doing. And it has such a powerful effect over time that it could cause... Uh, you know, some anxiety and confusion and so forth, but that'll pass. It, if it appears, you can be sure of one thing. If it comes, it'll go. Doesn't matter what it is. If it comes, it'll go. You will remain as you have always been. So thank you. I'm going to go. I'll see you back at the house. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to give Switters this chicken. <laughs> okay? Okay. <laughs>